Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. When I go to comic books, I go to superhero material. Superheroes are my jam. Oh, sure, I love other genres plenty, sci-fi, horror, fantasy. I'm big into the nerdy stuff above all else, but comic books? I tend to stick to the cape and costume fare. I scoff and roll my eyes at anyone who thinks that superhero material is less deserving of respect than any other genres. Because, of course, there's good and bad stuff, highbrow and lowbrow stuff, prestigious material, and utter trash, just like any other work of fiction. But while superheroes from Marvel and DC are what I love, you cannot deny that comic books as a medium have a very wide range of what sort of stories can be told. Manga managed to figure that out ages ago, but American comics have always struggled with getting the medium to get any kind kind of massive success outside of superheroes. But there is one very notable exception. Neil Gaiman's The Sandman. And what's hilarious is that The Sandman is an epic fantasy that basically put Neil Gaiman on the map outside of sequential storytelling, but a lot of the major lore and side characters featured in The Sandman are a part of DC Comics history, both in old superhero characters and horror titles that they had published before. Beforehand, Gaiman had done plenty of writing, most notably journalism material, a biography of Duran Duran, a companion book to The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and of course started writing Good Omens with Terry Pratchett. The Sandman wasn't Gaiman's first comics writing. He started getting into comics thanks to Alan Moore's Swamp Thing and befriended him, soon taking his advice and assistance entering into the UK comic scene on Miracle Man 2080 and a few other books. DC brought him in in 1987 for a miniseries called Black Orchid as part of the British invasion at comics in the late 80s, alongside Brian Bolland, Grant Morrison, and several others. What's also funny is that Gaiman wanted to write a ton of other stuff besides Black Orchid, having presented a list of characters characters he wanted to do, but they were all currently in use by other writers. Black Orchid was at the bottom of the list, but it also put him into a position that would lead him to Sandman. That's always the fun thing about working with lesser-known characters. The creative freedom with it because the higher-ups don't give a rat's ass if you radically alter the life of a mostly forgotten Bronze Age character like they would if you did it to Superman. The critical success of Black Orchid led to editor Karen Berger to offer Gaiman the chance to revamp a character that had been on his list of stuff he wanted to do. The Sandman. The only stipulation was that it couldn't be one of the established characters who had used the name before. It had to be a new character. And thus, in 1989, we saw the premiere of The Sandman, a DC title for mature readers only. So naturally, I, a guy who likes to make boner jokes, is the perfect audience for this. The Sandman is technically a DC legacy hero when you get right down to it, because, as mentioned, there were other heroes with that name before. The original was Wesley Dodds, the Golden Age hero who was inspired by pulp heroes with his businessman-style attire, but with a gas mask and sleeping gas gun. He also would develop a superpower of prophetic dreams, but also his cool original look would eventually be replaced with a more generic superhero outfit. In the 70s, Jack Kirby and Joe Simon created a new hero with the name, Real ID identity Garrett Sanford. His story is a little more complicated, but he was basically a dude who tried to protect children's dreams from nightmare monsters that could potentially kill them in their sleep. The Freddy Krueger Memorial Gang. He was assisted by two living nightmares named Brute and Glob, and we'll be getting back to them soon enough. Prior to the start of the Gaiman series, though, it's revealed that Sanford had gone insane. Long story short, he was stuck in a dream dimension he could only escape from for an hour at a time, and thus went mad from loneliness while his body was physically in a coma, and eventually committed suicide. He was replaced by the character Hector Hall, the son of the Golden Age Hawkman and Hawkgirl. And if you thought Hawkman's history was already confusing post-Crisis on Infinite Earths, just remember that Hector, his son, actually took on three different superhero identities, two of whom were other people's first. In this case, due to shenanigans happening at the time in the pages of Infinity Incorporated, Hector found himself possessing the body of Garrett Sanford and thus became the Sandman. He contacted his girlfriend, Lita, Lita? I'm going with Lita, to join him in the dream dimension and she accepted. Lita herself was a superheroine, and like Power Girl, was a refugee of the Crisis on Infinite Earths. Lita was originally the daughter of the Earth 2 Wonder Woman and Steve Trevor, probably thanks to her unique codename as Fury, again, like Power Girl not being obviously associated with Superman. She got carried over with a revised origin of being the daughter of a Golden Age Fury the creators invented. All of these retrospectives I've done are because they're important to me for my development in becoming a comics fan, and The Sandman is no different. It 
introduced me to a lot of DC lore I wasn't familiar with and expanded my understanding of what comics could do beyond superheroes. It also shows that you can take old ideas and give new spins on them, sometimes darker ones, but also sometimes just more fantastical. And despite it being its own thing, the Sandman would prove to be massively influential and still have effects even into the modern era, which we saw in Dark Knight's Metal last year. But we should probably start talking about it because there's a lot to cover. Let's dig into Neil Gaiman's The Sandman, number 1 to 20. So obviously, with a retrospective, as we've gone over before, I can't really talk about all the covers. We've got 20 issues alone we're looking at today. However, I'm sure people would want me to say something about Dave McKean's gorgeous covers that he did for every issue of the book's run. I don't like them. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Let it all out. Look, this is one of those it's me, not them kind of things. My personal philosophy about comic book covers is that they should be fairly reflective of the contents of the book, including in artistic style and plot. I'm already kind of iffy about having someone who isn't the book's regular artist doing the covers, but on top of that, the Sandman's covers are very unconventional. Very artsy, with rather surreal imagery, sometimes relating to the contents of the comic, but oftentimes in only the vaguest of ways. As I said, they're gorgeous, but I personally do not like it when a cover isn't representative of the contents. You could probably argue that it helps with a dreamlike atmosphere, given the plot and all, but I argue in turn that not every issue is dreamlike, nor requires that kind of mood setting. Consequently, the scans I'm using for these videos are not as high quality as the ones you might find for sale online or in modern trade collections. For some reason, they decided to recolor the books a while ago, probably to make it a little more consistent with where the book was going, but I prefer to use the coloring from when it's started just for the sake of presenting it as it was. It demonstrates how strong the material is, even if the art isn't perfect. So let's see where things started with issue one, Sleep of the Just. Dr. John Hathaway, the local museum curator, hurriedly arrives at the home of Roderick Burgess in England, 1916. Burgess is a rich sorcerer, and Hathaway's son has just died in World War I. Hathaway brings a book to Burgess, The Magdalene Grimoire. Burgess also goes by the title The Magus. I am using this pronunciation under protest after the last time you all said it goes like that. I still think Magus sounds better. After all, we don't pronounce magic magic, now do we? This is Jeff versus Gif all over again. Anyway, point is, Burgess says that with the grimoire, they can stop people from ever dying again. But mostly himself, because he's rich. While Burgess readies a magic ceremony, we see a series of children who are going to sleep. Some terrified, some peaceful. Of special note here is Unity Kincaid, a young girl in England who dreams of a tall, dark man whose eyes burn like twin stars. Unity dreams of Abe Vigoda. Assisting Burgess and his robed minions in this task is his son Alex. We'll be seeing more of him in a bit. The ritual commences. Bloodletting, chanting, and various mystical objects 
until a figure appears inside of a magic circle. Someone in green clothes, a lime helmet, almost a gas mask, a purple cloak, and red gloves. All of which were changed for the recolors to be darker and more consistent, but regardless, the figure has been captured and lays in the circle, also having with them a ruby and a pouch of sand. The minions think they succeeded, but Burgess knows better. They were trying to summon death itself, and this is not death. Still, he recognizes that this being is powerful, and they strip it of its clothes and objects. And that series of children we saw earlier? Some now have fallen asleep and are never going to wake up. Some now can't sleep at all. That spell has put a hiccup at that moment across the world. Unity Kincaid, for instance, now sleeping 20 hours a day. And damn it, they're not gonna invent Mountain Dew for another 30 years! They place the figure in a glass prison and try to offer a deal to them, but they don't respond. After World War I ends, Dr. Hathaway falls under suspicion of missing objects at the museum, and he tries to commit suicide and blame it on Burgess in his suicide note, but Burgess uses his magic to burn the note and escape justice. In 1926, Alex has done research on his own, and figured out, of course, that the figure they summoned was Dream of the Endless. And I should probably just explain the Endless here and save time for later, though admittedly it can be a difficult concept to wrap your head around. The Endless are seven embodiments of forces in the universe. Not gods, not representations, they just are those parts of it. It's just that the concept of death, the concept of dreams, happen to have personalities and wills of their own. While those concepts are immutable and, as the name implies, endless, it's those individualistic personalities and will that are for lack of a better term, vulnerable. They can be killed, or damaged, or, as we see in the first issue, imprisoned. But it's not like the universe breaks if that happens. People don't just stop dreaming because Dream is imprisoned here. He is a cog in the machine of existence. An important one, most certainly, but existence will fill the void and go on even if that embodiment is indisposed. We saw the hiccup in reality when it happened, and it affected all those kids, but life goes on for most everyone else. Nature abhors a vacuum and all that. In this case, we learned that a portion of Dream's power ended up with Wesley Dodds, the Golden Age Sandman, to try to fill that void in his own unique way. We'll meet the other members of the family later and what they represent, all having their own unique quirks and changes in personality and viewpoints on their professions. Also, all their names start with the letter D because shut up! Since his son was able to figure this out on his own, Burgess declares that Alex will be a suitable heir to his little empire when he dies which must upset the second-in-command of Burgess's little magic order, Sykes. In 1930, Sykes splits away from Burgess and takes Cash, Burgess's mistress, Ethel Cripps, and a bunch of magical objects, including those that had been taken from Dream. Magical war is declared. Confusion erupts as both sides use the rallying cry, pick a card, any card. Sykes makes a deal with a demon for protection from Burgess, trading in Dream's helmet for it. Said protection comes in the form of an amulet, which he loses in 1936 when Ethel Cripps leaves with it, Burgess making his head explode afterwards. We get a quick check-in with the kids, now adults, who were affected by Dream's capture, including the detail that Unity Kincaid was raped seven years ago and gave birth to a baby girl, her family hushing up the scandal. I bring this particular case up because it's actually going to be important later. In 1947, Burgess rants a dream about how he still refuses to speak, refuses to accept a deal, then just emotionally collapses. I... I didn't have to get so old. I shouldn't have had to get old. I don't know, man. You managed to capture one of the Endless. It's frankly on you if you couldn't figure out some way of using magic to extend your life. Watch my captor grow old and die. No satisfaction still here. I mean, it's good for a chuckle at least, but that's the first in like 30 years. It's like you're starving to death and you get a single jelly bean to eat. Up to 1955. Burgess is dead and Alex is in charge, now living with his boyfriend Paul, who thinks that maybe this whole thing has gone far enough, but Alex points out that letting him out would be bad, that he's not likely to be forgiving after being imprisoned for 40 years regardless of what they tell him. Still, he goes down and speaks to Dream, saying that the offer his father gave is still on the table. Power, immortality, and a promise that he won't seek revenge. Dream finally speaks, a single, no. And we finally get a look at him. I'm not going to bring up the live-action adaptation very often here for comparison, but there will be a few things that come up where I prefer the comic version. And no, I've never heard the audiobook version. I'm sure it's great, but it's a very different medium here. Being an adaptation, they make changes, and that's fine. The Sandman Netflix series is good, it's just different. 
Part of that being due to the fact that it's an adaptation, and it has to make certain choices with how it presents the material. Sometimes streamlining the plot, sometimes going for different moods than the comic, but it also changes how things look. Again, these are not bad decisions, it's just I have a preference. And personally, I don't really care for Tom Sturridge's dream. Well, at the time of this video's release, he's in his late 30s, he looks young and pretty, whereas Dream in the comic is visibly older, more unkempt, and a bit rougher around the edges. And the eyes really matter to me. They don't really change Dream's eyes in the show, whereas in the comic, Dream has black eyes with maybe a tiny pupil. And I get not wanting to wear contact lenses, really, I get it, especially for long hours, but it feels like they could have done some occasional changes to his eyes with CGI, even if not all the time. I wanted to be reminded that Dream is not a human being. By 1968, a bunch of hippie kids started coming to Alex to make him into some kind of quasi-mystical cult leader. Though mostly it was an excuse for tantric sex and cheap magic. Also, Stanley Dover stopped by at one point to spot Dream in the glass bubble and then steal the grimoire, but that's something we covered back in the Stanley and his monster miniseries. Anyway, Alex forbid any of the kids from doing psychedelic drugs in his house, worried that waking dreams might give some fuel for their prisoner. Likewise, giving coffee and amphetamines to the two guards in the basement to keep them from sleeping. By 1970, though, all the hippies have drifted away, and he hands the organizational aspects of his life over to Paul. Despite the ageless being in the basement who doesn't eat or sleep, Paul apparently doesn't believe in magic. Paul is an idiot. Alex's own mental state deteriorates as time goes on, becoming more obsessed with Dream. As the years pass, he gets older and more decrepit, ranting at Dream that they could learn so much from him if he cooperated, threatening him, etc. In 1988, after another ranting session, Alex inadvertently spins his wheelchair into the circle surrounding Dream, damaging the markings just a little bit. His guards don't notice. Boy, the old man's stroppy today. Anything happening then? Nah, same old rubbish. Says here that the Nemesis statue is crashing near Windsor Castle. Same old, same old. One of the guards starts rambling about his sexual prowess, which invites the other to very faintly daydream, and with the broken circle, that's finally enough of an opening for Dream, who seems to collapse inside the glass prison. The guards are smart enough to not try to enter themselves and get help, but said help decides to take a look inside, which allows him to finally escape and re-enter the realm of dreams. It feels so good to be back. I left a monarch, yet I return naked, alone. Hungry. Yeah, not enough politicians have that end up happening. He enters a dream and, amusingly, he has to actually steal Dream KFC from Colonel Sanders as if it was actual food for him. My first food in 70 years. I'm so hungry I don't even taste it. Going back to him later for popcorn chicken, though. He summons up some clothes for himself. Because he lacks the tools he had with him, the helmet, the ruby, etc., he's not as powerful as he should be and needs to retrieve them. Plus, that gives him the other thing that he wants... Revenge. With the King of Dreams free of his prison, the people who had been affected by his imprisonment are restored, for better or worse. For definite worse is Alex, who goes to bed and, in his dreams, is restored to his youth and met by Dream. He very quickly gets to the groveling, though Dream hushes him up. There are offenses that are unpardonable. Can you have any idea what it was like? Can you have any idea? Confined in a glass box for three score years and ten. A human lifetime. Time moves no faster for my kind than it does for humanity. And in prison, it crawled at a snail's pace. I asked for one goddamn rubber ball to bounce against the wall like Steve McQueen. That's all I wanted. Wanted. You barred me from my realm with your foolish circle, threatened, cajoled, and pleaded for gifts on neither mankind's to receive nor mine to give. You had no thought for the harm you must have brought to your world. The Paul brothers are your fault, you know. Alex admits that their goal had been to capture death, and Dream just says that he should consider himself lucky they didn't. Still, he demands the return of his tools, but Alex admits they were all stolen by Sykes 50 years ago. As such, Dream delivers his punishment to Alex. So, something to understand about the live-action series versus the original comic. The live-action series is fantasy, but the Sandman began, however, as horror fantasy. The live-action version has downplayed the horror elements, to its detriment in my opinion. Not that it's bad, just that they decided to go in a different direction, especially because the series would become less horror-focused as it went on. I don't think these stories are as strong without the horror elements, though. And early Sandman was... 
very horrific. Alex's punishment in the live-action series was eternal sleeping. In the comic, it's eternal waking. Have you ever had a dream where you woke up into another dream? I have, and it was just like this. Alex wakes up, only to find himself in a new nightmare of terrifying images and experiences. He wakes up and Paul speaks to him before his face melts. Alex wakes up and his nurse's head falls off, and it just keeps happening. He is condemned forever to wake up into another nightmare, and is in a coma in the real world. As the original promotional material said, Dream has shown him fear in a handful of dust. And that was the first issue. This opening storyline, Preludes and Nocturnes, is intended to set up a lot of stuff not only for the rest of the series, but our main character and the universes he inhabits. He is extremely powerful, but not invulnerable. He is not human, but he has human qualities, and he is not above cruelty or using his power against those who have wronged him. But let's move on to some more characters. As I said earlier, a lot of side characters and the like presented in Sandman are from older DC titles. And if I listed off every single one, we'd be here all day, so you'll forgive me if I skip over some of them. Retrospectives are long enough as it is. Still, we've got two big ones before us today. Cain and Abel. That is, the biblical Cain and Abel. The first murder. The two were DC horror hosts for anthology books, The House of Mystery and The House of Secrets, respectively. Cain is brash and cunning while Abel is cowardly and stuttering, with their shtick being that the former will murder the latter, who returns to life soon afterwards. The two live in The Dreaming, the realm where our protagonist calls home. And just to avoid redundancy in the word, we'll be referring to Dream by his other name from here on out, Morpheus. As I said, Dream is endless, but the personality we see is Morpheus. Dream is both his title and who he is. I know it's complicated, but yeah, Morpheus for now. Morpheus returns to the Dreaming and is nursed back to health a bit by the two brothers, where we learn that our hero also has another title that he holds that's pretty significant for the series, the Prince of Stories. I've actually been kind of puzzling about this one for a bit because, you know, dreams and stories are not the same thing, yet Morpheus does hold dominion over stories as much as he does dreams. The connection seems to be, as I understand it, that since dreams can encompass anywhere and anything, much like how stories can do the same, they overlap in their function. Stories are just a different kind of dream, creating visions in our imaginations of the events that transpire in them, both awake and asleep. Or maybe Neil Gaiman just couldn't come up with a synonym for stories that started with a D. Drama, maybe? Speaking of the letter D, let's head over to Arkham Asylum and John D, aka the supervillain Dr. Destiny. Oh, yeah, haven't I mentioned that yet? The Sandman is most known as one of the great early successes of Vertigo, DC's imprint for darker, more mature storytelling. But this is 1989, and Vertigo does not exist yet. The Sandman at this point is very much entrenched in the DC universe. So yeah, we're gonna see quite a few familiar faces in the issues to come. For now, though, the supervillain Dr. Destiny is visited by his mother, who we have met already. She's Ethel Cripps, the woman who stole the ruby from Sykes. Dr. Destiny is not in good shape, looking less like his traditional Skeletor costume and more just like a skeleton. Anyway, once he's recovered enough strength, Morpheus heads deeper into his realm, into his castle. And everything is in pretty bad shape. I mean, just look at the central pillar of that castle. Sure, it's phallic. Why wouldn't it be? There he meets the caretaker and official librarian of the Dreaming, Lucian. Like Cain and Abel, Lucian is actually another former DC horror host. A short-lived one at that, but one nonetheless. Also, get a load of this artwork of Morpheus's face and remember that this is the same dude who cursed someone to eternally waking up in nightmares. The Prince of Stories, everyone! Lucian explains that Morpheus is tied into the existence of the Dreaming, and the longer he was absent, the more the place began to decay. All the books in his library went blank, and that most of the creatures that inhabited this realm scattered or dispersed back into the stuff that dreams are made of where they had come from originally. Meanwhile, Cain gifts Abel an egg that hatches into a gargoyle that he names Irving, which pisses Cain off enough to murder Abel because gargoyle names are supposed to have names starting with G. See, Cain doesn't like dark Disney cartoons featuring Star Trek TNG actors, then. Later, Irving will gain the name Goldie. Just being in the Dreaming is helping Morpheus regain power, but he placed too much of his power inside his tools. Without them, he can't restore the Dreaming to its former glory. Lucian suggests he summon some guidance on where to find them. The Three Witches, 
Once again, DC Horror hosts from It's Midnight, The Witching Hour. We actually saw them briefly a few years ago when I reviewed one of the DC and Looney Tunes crossovers. Here, they're reimagined a bit as the three-in-one, all aspects of the same being, but split into three. They've gone by many names, including the ones used as horror hosts, but they're better known as the Furies of Greek mythology. The three constantly shapeshift into each other as he asks for their help. They're not too keen because apparently he refused to help them once before against Circe, but he explains that there are universal laws that must be obeyed. One of them being that he's allowed to ask three questions, one for each of the sisters. Aye, my dearie. One answer, then. One answer from each of us. Are you really the head of the Quickie Mart? Yes. Really? Yes. You? Yes. No, he asks for the whereabouts of his tools. He can't inquire more deeply, but it's a start. The ruby, as we saw before, ended up with Ethel Cripps and then to her son, John D, a.k.a. Dr. Destiny. The helmet was traded to a demon. The pouch of sand, however, was eventually purchased by John Constantine. Stop! I know what some of you are typing. I didn't think I'd have to get into it during the Hellblazer episode because of the comments from the previous time I'd mentioned him, but apparently we need to talk about this. His name is pronounced Constantine. You are absolutely correct that the Keanu Reeves movie and the popular Matt Ryan version in the Arrowverse pronounced it Constantine. And guess what? They're wrong. They're simply factually incorrect. I actually agree that Constantine sounds better, is a better pronunciation, but that's because I'm an American, and Johnny Boy is very much a British character where it is Tyne. All of his British creators who have worked on him say it is pronounced Constantine. They even put it in the comic itself that it's Constantine rhymes with wine. And people were very keen to inform me of this when I did the 500th episode where he was a prominent character and I kept saying Constantine, but I guess by the time the Hellblazer review came around, it swung the opposite direction. Hell, I remember when the Keanu Reeves movie came out and one of the big complaints about it was the pronunciation of the name and they used the different pronunciations as a way of distinguishing between the two. So there you go. But how could they have gotten it wrong? I don't know. We've spent decades asking the film and TV industry why they do some of the dumb things they do. This is just another example. I don't blame any of you who pronounce it Constantine, prefer it Constantine. I mean, in the Arrowverse, it's Constantine. But them's the facts for the comic. It's Constantine there, so I'm saying Constantine. Anyway, Morpheus thanks them for their help, but they laugh at this. You don't thank the fates, Dreamkin. <laughs> we haven't helped you. Your troubles are only just beginning. Ugh, nice ladies, but they are going to be the death of me. Morpheus decides he's not strong enough yet to visit Hell. In addition, he's been out of the loop for 70 years and knows nothing about superheroes, so he doesn't want to check in with the Justice League to learn about Dr. Destiny. As such, he decides to head after Constantine in the pouch, bringing us to issue three. The good Mr. Constantine is soon visited by Morpheus, demanding the pouch back. Well, I would, but you see, I already sold the pouch to two other members of the Endless. John is amenable, and they head to an old storage locker. For two hours, John searches before coming across an old photograph of himself with an ex-girlfriend of his named Rachel. She was a junkie who lived with him for a while, but then he took six months in Alaska to deal with the lupus affair. When I got back, she was gone, along with me stereo, the telly, me silver surfers, any old junk she could convert to money. Okay, two things. One, assuming Silver Surfers isn't some British slang term I'm not familiar with, DC just name-dropped the comics of their biggest competitor. Wow. Two, if that's the case, John Constantine's a Silver Surfer fan? He realizes that Rachel must have stolen the pouch, too, since she always liked to play with it. Chess, the cab driver, takes them to Rachel's dad's house, hoping to ask him for her whereabouts, but Morpheus consents the presence of the pouch in the house. They enter, and... Well, once again, things were a bit sanitized in the live-action version. There, Constantine just had a brief vision with Rachel again, talked about romantic stuff. Here? No, things are a bit... messier. They find a half-alive person in the house who Morpheus says is being eaten by dreams. Then John accidentally touches some... goo on the walls, and he suddenly has a vision of a falling dream before Morpheus pulls him out of it. So what's the goo on the walls? A human body. What's left of it? Your woman's father, I would surmise. But it 
it's still alive. That's right. Jesus Christ! Further into the house, they encounter more goo, but it's decidedly pinker and not human. The being in it telling them to leave, but Morpheus commands them to let them through. The creatures are dreams and indeed recognize their master, apologize, and slink away. They finally find Rachel, and she's... Yeah, your mileage may vary over who looked worse, this or the live-action version, but the point is the same. She's basically decayed now. The sand was not meant for human hands, and it's responsible for all this. Morpheus says they can leave, and that the dreams will return to their normal place in time, but John doesn't think they can leave Rachel like this. Morpheus says that she's basically dead already, but he screams that they can't leave her like that. This is actually a case where I'd say the show did it better, with Joanna ranting a bit more to Morpheus and pointing out his selfishness here. He's got his sandback who gives a crap about humans. You could argue that the comic did it better by saying less, but I think it wasn't saying enough in my opinion. He has John go outside and uses the sand to craft a dream for her to die peacefully in, walking into the sunset with John. Before Morpheus can leave, John does request one thing. Just ever since Newcastle, the last ten years. Ever since Newcastle, I've been having these nightmares. Bad ones. Most nights, and I wondered if you could... I understand. Very well. Your nightmares shall be intensified per your request. So, uh, did Dream go back at some point and clean up the one guy who was still alive but now goop? Anyway, this brings us to issue four, which is tied with issue six for my favorite comic in the series, A Hope in Hell. As mentioned earlier, Morpheus's helmet got sold to a demon. And, well, what better place to start looking than in hell itself? He admits that this is not going to be easy. Without his tools, he's not at full power and, well... It's hell. The guard at the gate doesn't buy that he's Morpheus due to the lack of said tools, but fortunately Morpheus is strong enough to shove him aside and get a better guide to the devil, Etrigan, the rhyming demon who I'm sure we've seen before on the show, but not often. Morpheus is impressed that Etrigan has risen in hell's ranks, being a rhyming demon is a promotion. To rise among the fallen? Strange and true. But as things change, Lord, they transmute as well. And if I've changed, O oh Dream King, then what of you? I have been absent for some time, but changed? Perhaps. Remember this, it'll be important later. Etrigan takes him past several places in hell, in particular a forest made of suicide victims in cages, one of which contains an old lover of his. She asks if he's come to free her at last, but Morpheus admits that while he still loves her, he has not forgiven her for something that has transpired. Yeah, the Endless have emotions just like anyone, sometimes they're more powerful or they don't quite grasp how it works for ordinary people, but Morpheus has had lovers in the past and none of his relationships ended well, frankly. Anyway, they arrive at Lucifer's palace, and I do love how the devil is portrayed in this one. Stereotypically angelic and humanoid in appearance, yes, even wearing white, but the wings are another matter, black with spiked edges along the top. They really do come across more as a fallen angel than a demon. This is all politics, really. Both are considered sovereign rulers of their respective kingdoms, so there is protocol and respect to be paid even if they have issues with each other. Morpheus explains how his helmet was stolen during his imprisonment and that a demon now possesses it. As such, he wants it back. If this was really hell, you just know that Lucifer would make him fill out like a thousand different forms to requisition it back and then deny the whole thing because of an undotted eye. As I brought up in the Hellblazer review, things have changed in Hell. Lucifer does not rule alone. Hell is now managed by a triumvirate, with Lucifer, Beelzebub, and Azazel all holding equal power. Some years ago, the Dark, the shadow creature, came forth to challenge Heaven. The episode ended in, perhaps a stalemate. But the civil war in hell that ensued tipped the precarious balance of power. We rule in coalition now. Zazzle, Beelzebub, and I. And sorry, Morpheus, but we can't help you. It's an election year. The events he talks about were apparently a thing that happened in Alan Moore's Swamp Thing, but the actual appearance of this triumvirate first occurred here. With the three gathered, Morpheus explains that a demon has his helmet, but he doesn't know which one. Then let us summon all of them to tell, and meet them on the vasty plains of hell. Ugh, summoning everybody around here for an in-person meeting? This is hell. But yeah, apparently it's that easy to bring in all the denizens of hell. It's not a small amount, but sadly I don't think the art quite portrays the vastness of how much that would be, even with a two-page spread. Still, Morpheus quickly locates the demon, 
Corinzon. Unfortunately, Corinzon points out that he got the helmet in a legitimate trade. He has broken none of Hell's laws, thus if Morpheus wants it back, he needs to challenge him for it. Morpheus thinks he may not be strong enough, but he really has no other choice, so he accepts. So, as the challenged, I choose the battlefield. I assert reality. Virtual reality! As a demon from hell, I'm a big fan of the virtual boy. In the show, Corinzon had to pick a champion for himself and had Lucifer fight in his place. Not the case here, and I think it's one of the adaptation changes that makes sense. Especially by doing so, they put more emphasis on the relationship between the two rulers instead of just some random demon. It also gives a chance for Matthew the Raven to play a part in it, and Matthew hasn't even shown up in the comic yet. But still, one thing that I much prefer with the comic is that they make this an event in Hell. In the show, it's done fairly privately in Lucifer's chambers. Here, it's like a demonic nightclub where the two are having, like, a poetry slam or a rap battle in front of a ton of demons. Still, the idea is roughly the same in both. Morpheus and Corinzon need to alter reality to create a new opponent that can defeat the one they just made. Corinzon summons a wolf, Morpheus a hunter on a horse, then a horse fly to kill the horse and throw the rider, then a spider to kill the fly, etc. The show also depicts this as the rulers taking physical damage from this, which is a really neat idea and realization of it. I just like the jazz club idea thing too, especially since Morpheus has this outfit on. The direction of the fight changes. Instead of animals, they expand to the cosmos. A world giving way to a supernova, giving way to the universe, giving way to anti-life. And thus we get to Morpheus's counter to that. What defeats the end of everything? The end of universes and gods and worlds? Hope. And Corinzon has nothing that can stop it. I suppose if you want to be pedantic, you can kill hope with despair, but let's not play the game any further. Corinzon doesn't think of it, and thus he loses. Corinzon is dragged away for failing, and Morpheus's helmet returned to him. Morpheus compliments them and says it's very honorable of them to do this, and he'll remember it. But, of course, they're the lords of hell, so they're kind of assholes, and point out that all of hell is gathered here, and they can just prevent him from leaving. Helmet or no, you have no power here. What power have dreams in hell? Eh, only veto power, but it's considered impolite to do so, so it's never done. However, Morpheus explains to not only Lucifer, but all the demons, what power would hell have if those here imprisoned were not able to dream of heaven? I mean, they would still have the fire and the poking and the penis flatteners. Let's not pretend they don't have any power here. But of course he's right, and the demons part to allow him to leave. Lucifer telling the other two of the Triumvirate that one day he'll destroy Morpheus. In the epilogue, we learn that Ethel Cripps has died, leaving John D. one object in her will. The demonic protective amulet. I love this issue. I love the imaginative battle. I love the writing tying the theme of hope throughout it in a subtle way until it not only wins the contest, but indeed Morpheus's message about hell only having power if those it tortures can dream of something better. I love the artwork's twisted vision of hell. I love the brief exploration of hell politics. It's just a phenomenal issue with great fantasy elements and an optimistic message. Just good stuff all around. This brings us to issue five, Passengers. John D. is able to escape from Arkham Asylum. Someone escaping from Arkham Asylum? <laughs> now we know this is fantasy. After exchanging some words with Jonathan Crane, who even says to tell him all about his evil plans once he gets back, D. uses a stolen gun to force a woman to drive him to where the ruby is kept. I'll tell you where to stop. Trust me, I'm a doctor. I would, but you're a dermatologist and you look like this. Time for our reminder that this is the DC Universe as Dream starts searching for his ruby with the Justice League, beginning with the artist, credited to Sam Keith and Malcolm Jones III, emulating Jack Kirby a bit when Mr. Miracle is having a nightmare. It's during the Justice League International days, and this isn't the weirdest thing that's happened to them, so he's happy to look for the ruby, even enlisting the help of the Martian Manhunter. Jean actually recognizes Morpheus, though as a Martian deity of dreams. He tells our hero where they kept the ruby after the JLA satellite crashed, and thanks them both. Meanwhile, despite her fear of John D, the driver of the car, Rosemary, seems to be building a bit of a rapport with him as he explains his backstory a bit and what the ruby could do. People think dreams aren't real because they aren't made of matter, of particles. Dreams are real, but they are made of viewpoints, of images, of memories, and puns, and lost hopes. Also, sometimes they're made of string cheese, and other times made of traffic cones. I know, I don't get it either. I didn't really have a lot of time to study it before I became a supervillain. 
He also mentions that he modified the ruby quite a bit, though it affected him the more he used it, taking away his ability to dream. Morpheus, meanwhile, reaches the storage unit and quickly finds the ruby, but when he touches it, something overwhelms him and he falls unconscious. Dee and Rosemary arrive at the storage facility and... Yeah, unlike how this played out in the show, Dee kills her. Why? Well, that's something we'll get into in the next issue. Dee finds the ruby and the unconscious Morpheus. He takes it and walks out, soon finding himself at a 24-hour diner, where he sits in the back and leads to my other favorite issue of Sandman, 24 Hours. This was also a story that was heavily modified in the live-action version, and in kind of a weird way. In the show, they made Dee's motivations more about lying, that if he removed people's lying and mistruths and deceptions, that the world would be a better place, a freer place. They set it up very early on and played it through in their version of these events. But as I said, the show was downplaying the horror elements, so 24 Hours, which is very much a horror story, doesn't have quite the same bite to it. And yet they still included some very horrific imagery in it. So if they were trying to remove the horror stuff, why keep that and change other things? They go for a message in it too, where Dream explains that D takes away people's dreams, their hopes for the future, and that actually leads to them being worse people, but in doing so, it removes the visceral terrors of the story and also doesn't properly convey what's happening. All the events that we see in the diner are occurring to the entire world, but we only see it from the perspective of the diner, so we can imagine just how awful it is out there. And it's not bad, it's just different, and I think it works better in the comic. I'm not going to get into a lot of the specifics because, well, we've still got a lot more issues to cover after this. And also, I like being monetized, and some of this is yeesh. But if you want more details, Morate did a long box of the Damned episode on it back in the day. We start out slow, introducing the characters and their stories from the skewed perspective of the diner waitress. Some of it is her wholesome thoughts, some of it is her own homophobia and, frankly, naivete about people or how she wants things to be. John D. uses his power to keep them from leaving the diner, then expanding his influence to the rest of the world causing them to kill themselves and others, which we can see in news reports and TV shows. He has them repeat events over and over, lets them live out their own fantasies and dreams, oftentimes violent ones, perversely experiencing their joys vicariously, but only really liking it when the fantasies are awful. He makes them fight each other, then worship him. The world continues to fall apart. He makes them admit to their most shameful, heinous acts, makes them do horrible things to each other, makes them fight, torture, and murder each other, briefly gives them lucidity again, and while the TV show gave D a motivation, how he wanted to make the world better, when asked by the patrons why he's doing this to them, John's response reflects the monster that he is. Because he can. Dr. Destiny did not have an origin story, not even a real name pre-Crisis when he was introduced and fought the Justice League multiple times. He was just a supervillain with incredible technology that later involved dreams. And we're seeing that kind of mindset of villainy in full display in this story. Why is he doing this? Because he has no motivation. He has no deeper meaning behind his acts. No great goal or aspiration that he wants to use this power for. He is a monster because those stories needed a monster. And this is what happens when no one is around to stop the monster. The people in the diner are not good. Hardly. We learn all the horrible things they've done and believe in themselves... But we also see bits of humanity in them, regrets and hopes and other aspects. We see nothing of the sort from John D., who killed the woman who he kidnapped to drive him to the storage unit for no reason other than he decided to do it. Villainy for amusement's sake. Murder and torture to give some entertainment to himself. He is evil because he is evil, and that is his destiny then, now, and forever. The people whom he kills, and yes, by hour 22, everyone in the diner but him is dead, did not deserve their own fates. And John D.'s evil is the promise of all evil. Eventual boredom, because his sadism is forever wanting and empty. He even says he was getting a bit bored when Morpheus, having finally awoken, arrives at the diner to see what he has wrought. Leading us to issue 7, Sound and Fury. After admitting to Morpheus that he doesn't really have a reason for why he's doing the horrible things he's doing to the world, which, to me, the most subtly horrifying image we see in this montage is a 911 operator sobbing because she has no more ambulances to send to people and the calls keep coming in. Morpheus explains that he created the ruby to manipulate the fabric of dreams in the world he rules, 
but it was not made for this. He's not strong enough to repair the damage that D has done without his tools, so he needs to undo whatever he did to the ruby and give it back. Naturally, D just says he's gonna kill the Dream Lord. I also love that Morpheus doesn't keep trying to plead with him after this. It's clear that D won't see reason, so accepts the challenge and says they'll meet in battle in the Dream Realm. As the world continues to burn and people hurt and kill each other, D enters the realm of dreams and is confronted with surreal dream images that shift around until he banishes them and calls out to Morpheus to finally face him. Realizing that the ruby stole some of Dream's power when he touched it, D tries to use it to drain everything left of him, but in the process ends up shattering the ruby. He is left in a white void. So now I rule the dream world. I will hide in dreams. I'll never go back. Never leave here for the real world where people hurt you, where they don't care. Spoken like someone who's never dreamed of showing up to class naked. He rants and rambles how he's the new King of Dreams. Until we pull back to reveal that the world is not so much a void, it's Morpheus' hand. And he's dressed like this. Thank you, John D. Finally, my casual slacks and beige t-shirt. Truly vestments fit for a king. By shattering the ruby, it released all its power out and back into Morpheus, now giving him his full control over the dreaming. It's mellowed him out a bit, to the point where he admits he could kill John D for what he's done, but nah, the ruby likely twisted his mind simply by it being an object not meant for human hands, so he elects to return him to Arkham Asylum. Uh, not criticizing dude, but isn't Arkham Asylum still kind of a hellhole here? Sure, great you're not killing him, but you're not exactly putting him in a place where he can get the help he needs. John says he's sorry about what he did, though how sincere that is is up for debate. They even meet Dr. Crane again, who welcomes him back and tells Morpheus that things have been going badly around the place, well with the end of the world and all, and something needs to be done. Morpheus agrees, deciding that on this night, humanity will sleep in peace. It seems like he puts the entire world to sleep off the madness, give them a breath of calm. It's not really explicit if he repaired all the damage, if the dead are alive again or not, but for the moment, the Earth is at peace again, and we can presume something like that happened, since no one's really talking about any of this in the next issue. Speaking of, that brings us to issue Eight, the sound of her wings. We've learned quite a bit about Morpheus, so now it's time to meet the one that Burgess had failed to capture. His sister Death, depicted as a pale goth woman with an Ankh necklace. What are you doing? Feeding the pigeons. One of the lesser duties of the King of Dreams, but I've been neglecting it for the last 80 years. She quotes Mary Poppins at him. I love that movie. You ever see it? No. I don't know if you've noticed, sister, but I was kind of gone for 80 years. I missed a lot. Death in Sandman is... Nice, peaceful, happy, comforting, and joyful. Inspired by a drawing a friend had made of a woman named Cinnamon Hadley, Death is probably the most popular character of the entire series, and it's easy to see why. While not the first unconventional representation of Death ever, as in one that doesn't really befit the Grim Reaper or a dark, terrible creature, it's still a fun way of looking at the concept. Not as an inevitable tragedy, but as someone who can provide a laugh and some perky joy in one's final moments. Many take great comfort in that, that in the end, we're not met with darkness and cold, but instead a warm hand who will go with you on the journey, into whatever waits for us after this one. Which admittedly, according to the story, could in fact be hell because it's a real place people go to in this universe, but still, at least you got pleasant company along the way. Death has had a number of spin-off miniseries, probably the most out of any character in the series, that explores her in more detail, as well as presenting some interesting concepts and ideas about her. As it happens, the original plan for this retrospective was that the first three parts would cover the main series itself, and the final part would look at all the Sandman spin-off miniseries. Did you know that there are like 40 or so spin-off comics, some of which are just as long as this series? I didn't when I had that idea, and it's why we're not doing that. Anyway, Morpheus is bummed out because after all he went through to get his revenge and regather his tools and restore his power, he just feels depressed and lacks direction now. Death calls him out on his bullcrap. He's having a pity party for himself because his game is over instead of going to find a new one. She invites him along with her as she makes her rounds, collecting the dead. Some are tragic, some are hopeful. One is kind of racist, and one is funny. Morpheus can't understand why they fear her so much, taking comfort in the sound of her wings as she brings them to the next life. 
He remembers that he has responsibilities just as she does, and he takes comfort in that. The joy of life as a cycle of many things. Tragic, hopeful, and funny, and ultimately leading to an end. But for now, he has things to do. That brings us to issue 9 and the next major storyline. The first eight issues were collected and named Preludes and Nocturnes. This was back in the day when there might be multi-part storylines in comics, but each issue tended to be a tale in itself rather than a big story split over the course of four to six months. And thus we begin the second storyline, The Doll's House, with the first part elaborating on that woman in hell whom Morpheus was mad at. It's consequently where we learn that Morpheus is kind of a jackass. An African tribal leader brings his son out to a spot in the desert, a ritual that was passed down over the centuries, taking a shard of unusual glass and telling the tale of where it came from. The tale is told only once and only after the younger man is circumcised, the glamour of youth about how once upon a time they lived in a city of glass when the area was fertile and not a desert. The city was ruled by Queen Nada, who was continually advised to take a husband, but her response was that she didn't know where the man for her was. A stranger came to town and she saw him and instantly fell in love. However, they couldn't find the stranger afterwards despite a heavy search, so they went to the next best place to locate him. She went into the forest until she found the King of the Birds. Who, Darius? I wouldn't talk to him, he's got that weird skull thing. The Bird King, who has a tiny crown that's kind of adorable, soon learns where she can find the stranger, though advises her not to pursue, that whatever he is is neither god nor man, and it'd be better if she found someone made of flesh and blood. Thanks to a mystical berry she ate, she's transported into the dream time and discovers that the stranger is Morpheus, known at the time as Kaikul. Turns out he's into her too, but upon discovering that he's one of the Endless, she flees, explaining that mortals are not supposed to love the Endless and that disaster would only follow if she tried to pursue this. He's adamant, but she continually refuses, even after he says that he'd make her queen of the dreaming, for love is not part of the dream world. Love belongs to desire, and desire is always cruel. So dreaming of falling in love and being with people forever isn't a thing? That's kind of a bummer. Eventually, after pursuing her, they bang. When the sun arose that morning and saw the two of them together, it knew that something that was not meant to be had happened. And a blazing fireball fell from the sun and burnt up the city of glass, raising it to the ground, leaving just a desert. The sun is an incredibly petty douchebag who murders an entire city full of people because their queen got laid. This justifies my lifestyle choice of being a pasty nerd who reviews comic books in his basement. Nada says that worse will happen if they stay together and she commits suicide. Morpheus is pissed, offering her spirit one final time to join him, but if she refuses, she'll be condemned to eternal pain. Given that we saw her in hell, you can guess how that went. Dream of the Endless! Prince of Stories! Lord of the Unwaking! King of the Assholes! The Elder tells his son to put the glass somewhere, and someday he'll tell the tale to someone else. This is a thing that happens sometimes in the series, where we'll take an issue or so to learn about part of Morpheus' backstory, and consequently that he's kind of bad at relationships. Still, let's move on to issue 10 and The Doll's House proper. We briefly meet two more of the Endless. The first is Desire, whose realm is some kind of giant statue of themselves. Since the concept of Desire is not really bound to any particular gender, they're always portrayed as fairly androgynous in appearance, with the narration saying that Desire has never been satisfied with just one sex, so if we had to put a label on them, I'd say they're gender fluid, though don't take my word for it. Desire apparently has designs on Morpheus, wanting to manipulate them in various ways, which includes what happened with Nada. We also meet their frequent partner in crime and another of the Endless, Despair, who is apparently Desire's twin, though not exactly identical ones. Desire mentions that a Dream Vortex has appeared, and they plan to take advantage of this. And thus we meet Rose Walker and her mother Miranda, who travel to England to meet with someone who paid for their trip. As it turns out, it's an elderly Unity Kincaid, one of the people stuck in sleep when Morpheus was imprisoned. It turns out Miranda is her long-lost daughter, sent to be adopted by her family to avoid the scandal and all that, but she wants to be reunited with her now that she's awake. Aw, ain't that sweet. So anyway, this storyline is actually about a living nightmare who's a serial killer. Let's back up a bit. Rose is the dream vortex that Desire was talking about. What that means exactly isn't said in this issue, but she's able to actually view the dreaming as she sleeps. 
a fact that Morpheus is aware of. As he reassembles his kingdom, Morpheus has Lucian take a census of the realm. Four beings are unaccounted for. The first two are Brute and Glob, the living nightmares who I mentioned in the intro. The third is Fiddler's Green, a mythological place akin to a heaven for long-traveled sailors that is alive in this story. And finally, the aforementioned serial killer, the Corinthian. Morpheus thinks that the dream vortex that is Rose will eventually draw the missing nightmares to her. And he's not wrong. Rose gets a visit from the three witches, who warn her to beware of dreams and houses, but we also learn that she has a brother, Jed, who is missing. We enter issue 11 with Rose beginning a search for Jed by moving into a boarding house in Florida full of strange characters. We meet two of them right away. Barbie and Ken. Seriously. That's really weird, because Barbie's a Marvel character. As well as two women who spend all their time in wedding dresses and veils named Zelda and Chantal. Zelda and myself have lived here for two years. We possess the largest collection of stuffed spiders in private hands on the eastern seaboard. Yeah, well, I have a ton of Bulbasaur plushies. And Cybermats. Beat that. There's another, Gilbert, who we'll meet soon. In the meantime, we learn that Rose's mother divorced their father when they were young. He took Jed with him, and they hadn't heard from them in years. Said father died in a car accident a few years back, and Jed went to live with his grandfather, a lighthouse keeper, but said grandfather ended up drowning, and Jed went off to live with his father's cousins, who were heavily abusing him while collecting money from the state with him as a dependent. However, we learn a few things of interest. One, that he dreams of going on adventures with the Hector Hall Sandman and Lita, and two, that he has somehow become disconnected from the dreaming. This is our proper introduction of Matthew the Raven, as Morpheus sends him to spy on Rose Walker and suspects that what's going on with Jed is somehow connected to the missing beings from his realm. Matthew is a very interesting case here, because he is a previously established DC character like the horror hosts. But also, I mean he was a full character. A human character. Matt Cable was a supporting character in Swamp Thing, having a ton of storylines in that one, including one that eventually led to DC dropping the Comics Code label on it because of the weird sex stuff that was going on in the book. Shock of all shocks, it was an Alan Moore story. Point is, because the character died while in a coma and dreaming, Morpheus offered him the chance to become one of his ravens, something he apparently does on occasion whenever he needs one to serve him as a scout or just a companion to talk to. Matthew is dispatched to keep an eye on Rose during all this. Speaking of, Rose is rescued from some skinheads that plan to attack her after she attends a drag show featuring her landlord, which, personally, I would have enjoyed seeing the drag performers coming out to kick the neo-Nazis' asses. By Gilbert, the aforementioned other tenant of the boarding house. Thanks to a private detective, she learns about Jed's more recent history and goes with Gilbert, armed with a cane sword and a revolver, to go after him while Morpheus discovers that it was Brute and Glob who severed Jed's connection to the Dreaming, and are living in his mind. He is pissed about it. Honestly, he seems more angry about this than he did about his imprisonment. But then again, that was an offense done to him personally, and this was an offense done to a child, so I'd be pretty mad too. And it leads us into issue 12. We see Hector and Lita hanging out with Brute and Glob in some kind of high-tech base monitoring dreams. And we very quickly discern that something's wrong. Lita is quasi-catatonic, drifting around the house and casually mentioning to Hector that the two of them decided to live permanently in the dream world while she was six months pregnant, but it's been two years since then, and she still hasn't delivered the baby. Hector, for his part, is oblivious to all this, acting like a stereotypical Silver Age superhero and not noticing anything being wrong. The two nightmares barely have to do anything to poke him into service, not noticing that despite the job being about protecting the dreams of children, the only child they ever interact with is Jed. Well, hey, Morpheus knows what's up, and he's coming in to save the day. Hector and Lita will have a happy life free of the nightmares, evil will be defeated, and Jed will be rescued, and every Everyone's gonna be happy, right? Right? Morpheus very quickly gets through their defenses and is rather amused by Hector Hall's declaration that he's the Sandman, defender of dreams and all. Brute and Glob explained that they set all this up because in his absence, they wanted to try to make their own King of Dreams under their control, using both Garrett Sanford and Hector Hall for this task. He sends them to be tortured by darkness for a thousand years, but unfortunately, that brings us to the next problem. See, Morpheus talks about humanity and how much he loves them and has tried to help and protect them, but he does not understand humans, especially when they are suffering. He may understand the broad idea of inflicting pain bad, hurting people very bad, using his tools to cause suffering bad, but when it comes down to individual pain and torment, 
he's really kind of clueless. Morpheus sees his responsibilities as the Dream Lord as the beginning and end of his existence, occasionally straying from them for personal amusement or romantic attachment, but when confronted by Hector Hall in the real world, now freed from Brute and Glob's influence, he discards him as a ghost that is walking the earth when he should not and banishes him away. And Lita? She's still quasi-catatonic, distant and disassociating with all this, only breaking from it when it looks like Morpheus has killed her husband. Morpheus just casually says, Oh, he was already dead, whatever. And of course, this does not placate her. What's worse, not only does he not offer any comfort or explanation of what just transpired, but when she tries and fails to attack him, he out of nowhere proclaims that her unborn baby is his, and he's going to claim it someday. Our hero, everybody! It's a similar attitude that he had concerning Rachel after the effects of the dream powder. It took Constantine to yell at him to get him to recognize that, oh, this is a living thing suffering and I can't just shrug it off. Unfortunately, no one exists like that for Lita, who is just confused and angry by this being that, from her perspective, just murdered her husband and is promising to steal her baby. As for Jed, Morpheus' breaking of the private dreaming that Brute and Glob had made causes some kind of massive energy burst that kills his abusive family and he goes wild wandering off, forgotten by Morpheus. He ends up hitchhiking and is picked up by the Corinthian. Issue 13, we're gonna skip for a minute. It's good, but it's another flashback story to Morpheus' past, and we should get back to the proper narrative of the doll's house. In the last issue, Rose and Gilbert's rental car broke down and they had to head to a nearby motel, originally planning on only staying overnight. The motel agreed to this because of that, but they didn't want the two there because the hotel was completely booked up for a convention. A serial convention! Captain Crunch was the guest of honor, trying to teach people new strategies to keep the Soggies from ruling. Collectors, as the issue is called, is not about serial. This is a convention for serial killers. And Captain Crunch would be totally inappropriate for that. Killing in wartime like he did isn't really the same thing. Collectors is another favorite of mine, simultaneously funny and disturbing, and another of the early horror successes of the series. As someone who's gone to plenty of conventions, it's fun to see elements somewhat parodied as you've got panel discussions on various kinds of serial killers. For instance, a religion panel featuring one guy who claims to be God having to argue with murderers who claim to kill in God's name. A dance hall that these killers can twist the night away in. Guest speakers of famous killers, and even opening ceremonies with jokes. And yet simultaneously, along with a panel on woman serial killers not wanting to be stereotyped as black widows or killer nurses, you have someone break down and admit that they were hoping someone at the convention would understand how much he wants help and doesn't want to kill people anymore. And the worst part is the weekend pass's price tripled if you hadn't pre-registered. Rose had tried to call ahead to inquire about Jed, but the police answered and explained how her relatives were dead and they needed to stay put at the hotel, even telling the hotel to accommodate them despite the convention. Gilbert spots the Corinthian in an elevator, recognizing him, and warns Rose to say Morpheus' name aloud in case she runs into trouble, while he goes off on his own to investigate. And indeed, one of the killers, a child molester and murderer, attacks Rose and forces her to call on him, who saves her. Like with Lita, he does nothing to comfort her other than warn her to get out of the hotel for a bit while he takes care of business. This isn't for your eyes. The Corinthian, having been recruited as the guest of honor after the previous one failed to show up, makes a rallying speech about how awesome serial killing is, and how they're the truly special and amazing, and the American dreamers, and yeah, Morpheus shows up and tells him he's full of it. You disappoint me, Corinthian. Man, imagine your dad showing up when you're making a big speech and proclaiming to the crowd how much you suck. The Corinthian, with hungry, terrifying mouths instead of eyeballs, was apparently Morpheus's masterpiece. A... Nightmare created to be the darkness and the fear of darkness in every human heart. A black mirror made to reflect everything about itself that humanity will not confront. But instead of living up to that while wandering this whole time, he's just... a serial killer. Just something else for people to be scared of. That's all. To be fair, Morpheus, even that descriptor you gave of his intended purpose is still just something else for people to be scared of. Just a bit more so. You've told them that there are bad people out there, and they've known that all along. But not me, because I have done nothing bad ever. The Corinthian tries to fight him, but 
Well, he's a dream, and Morpheus is the lord of dreams who created him. So he just uncreates him and says he'll try to do better the next time he makes him. And as for the serial killers, who were probably very confused about what just happened, he takes their sustained fantasies, their comforting daydreams that they're righteous and special and the maltreated heroes of their own stories, and strips them of that delusion. They walk away from the convention with the knowledge at all times of what they truly are and how pathetic they are. Still, on the plus side, nobody caught con plague and there are no elevator parties. See y'all next year! Gilbert, meanwhile, has found and rescued Jed, leading us to issue 15. There's not much else to say about the overall story of issue 15. The majority of it deals with the dreams of the inhabitants of Rose's boarding house. Some insights into the characters, Barbies will be significant next time, but consequently what Rose as a dream vortex is capable of. Unity Kincaid is dying, so Miranda Walker has to stay with her. Jed is not in great shape after everything that happened with him, and Gilbert goes to watch over him. Matthew soon sent out to retrieve Gilbert, who is, in fact, Fiddler's Green made into human form. Rose, for her part, finally sleeps, but is somehow able to sense the dreams of everyone around her, and pushes at the walls separating them, combining and traumatizing them all a bit by mixing very disparate, different experiences that were not meant to interact. Morpheus pulls her into the dreaming, and we learn, via conversation between Gilbert and Matthew, that he intends to kill her. The only time he's truly empowered to take a human life. Now, torture people? Oh boy, he can do a lot of that. Isn't that right, Alex? Morpheus explains to Rose why she has to die. Once in every era, a mortal becomes the center of the dreaming and is capable of shattering the barriers between dreaming minds, sucking them all into one until the vortex collapses and takes the minds of those around her with it. It ends up damaging the dreaming beyond repair. It's part of Dream's duties to prevent this from happening, and he failed once before to stop it, resulting in an entire world getting destroyed in the process. He doesn't know why this happens, but it does, and it needs to be stopped. He does offer her the chance to stay in the dreaming after death, as happened with Matthew, but she does have to die on Earth. Sure, you'll be dead, but at least you'll have a nice split level that's on the bus line. Matthew and Gilbert show up, the latter trying to convince Morpheus to let him die in her place, but it doesn't really work like that. He also explains that he left the dreaming to experience life as a human, enjoy substance and victories and defeats he never could as just a place. Honestly, it's something that I think would have made a huge difference for Morpheus as a character if he had done the same thing. Take some time living as a human. Even death does it sometimes to remind herself why life is so precious. Gilbert resumes his role as Fiddler's Green, inviting Rose to visit him if she stays in the dreaming. Back in the real world, as Unity starts dying, she falls asleep and reappears, younger and with purple hair, in the dreaming. She says that she can die in Rose's place. She was supposed to be the Vortex, not Rose, but then Morpheus got imprisoned and it caused a hiccup in everything. She can take on the part of Rose that's the Vortex and die instead. That's brilliant! How does she know all this? Like, there's some narration that says she hears a whisper of her own voice that reveals the truth, but like, how does she even comprehend all this? From her perspective, she spent decades asleep. She's probably still wrapping her head around VCRs and Super Mario Brothers. Anyway, she takes this heart and Morpheus kills her. And since she was already dying in the real world from old age, it allows everything to come to pass naturally. Unity will remain in the dreaming, and Morpheus explains that Rose's family has suffered enough. He'll make sure that Jed awakens and lives on. After the trauma of what happened, the boarding house inhabitants are making a change. Barbie and Ken getting divorced, Hal heading out west towards Hollywood, Zelda and Chantel buy up the boarding house for themselves, and, well... Gilbert's gone. Unity left all her money to Miranda, and Rose takes six months to recover from the events of this, but in the end, walks away with a haircut and deciding to color it purple, too. We also get some more connection back to earlier, with it turning out that Rose was friends with one of the diner patrons from 24 Hours, and indeed that they died and did not come back, so that's a bummer. Rose takes her experiences to mean that there's a lot more about the world than humanity understands, and forces that treat humanity as their toys, their dolls. However, Morpheus has the opposite attitude, as he explains. 
But first, he pays a visit to Desire as he's put the pieces together. Desire was the one who assaulted Unity while she was sleeping, setting this chain of events in motion. They knew that this would somehow pass the vortex down along the family tree, and Morpheus, whenever he escaped, would be forced to kill her. But the bigger deal would have been that Morpheus, even unknowingly, would have murdered a member of his family since Desire was her grandparent. Morpheus explains that the Endless are the servants of the living. They exist because, deep down, mortals know they exist. They are the dolls of the living, not the other way around. Still, even if Desire rejects that attitude, he makes it clear to them one thing. Interfere with him or his realm again, and he will respond in kind. And he'll be backed up by Destiny and Death, who are far more powerful than Desire or Despair. Also, he says this while Desire has cat ears and a cat tail, so you know Desire has their finger on the pulse of what a lot of people want. Before we move on to our final issues for today, let's take a step back to issue 13, Men of Good Fortune. As I said, this one's kind of weird in that it's slapped right smack in the middle of the Doll's House storyline, even though it has nothing to do with what's going on. Still, it's a significant one, and a really good one. In 1389, Morpheus and Death are hanging out in a pub, Death trying to get her brother to understand more about humanity. They overhear a man named Hob Gadling saying that nobody has to die, they just die because everybody does it and goes along with it. You hear that, decapitation victims? It's on you. Yeah, I remember back in the 90s when it was really trendy to die. Just the biggest fat in the world right alongside Beanie Babies. In any case, he declares that he will not die. He has too much to see and experience. As such, Death and Morpheus overhear this and decide to play his game. Morpheus declares that he will not die, and they will meet again in 100 years in the same tavern to discuss what he's learned. And thus we cut to 1489 and the two meet again. Hob wondering if he's made some sort of deal with the devil or the like, but Morpheus explains that he's just curious. Death won't touch him unless Hob wants it. So this whole time, Burgess could have just talked to the two of them and said, hey, Hey, can I get the same deal as that dude? Went to a lot of trouble being a dick for it. Hob marvels at some of the modern inventions that make life better, like chimneys and handkerchiefs. He's even investing in this goofy idea called printing. It'll never be popular, but hey, beats dying. And it becomes a regular ritual. Come back every hundred years to check in. So in 1589, the two of them meet yet again, and Hob, now going under the name Sir Robert Gadlin, it's become commonplace for him to leave for a year, then come back as his own son, has acquired a bit of wealth thanks to investing in shipping. Honestly, the most unrealistic part to me is that this same building is still a pub or restaurant many centuries later. It's not impossible, just seems a little far-fetched that it hasn't been repurposed for something else by now. I don't know, maybe Morpheus has some kind of influence and is keeping it around for these meetings. Still, he seems unimpressed by the things he's talking about, including marrying and finally having a son after 200 years. Instead, Morpheus is impressed with some weirdo playwright who's getting some harsh feedback on his first play, and proclaiming that he'd give anything to be able to write like Kit Marlowe. Morpheus takes him up on that offer, that this... Will Shaxbird or whatever can make some great plays and that they'll strike a deal. But let's advance another hundred years to 1689 and things have not gone well for Hob. His wife and child died and that put him in a severe depression. Staying in his house long enough for people to notice how long he'd been alive without aging and they tried to drown him as a witch. And yeah, he's immortal and stuff, but he still suffers pain and hunger and the last 80 years have not exactly been providing sumptuous feasts. Morpheus asks if he'd like the respite of death finally. Are you crazy? Death is a mugs game. I got so much to live for. So many new places on the streets to urinate. So many new rats to try to hunt down and eat. In 1789, things have turned around for Hobbs so that he's back on top but not from a pleasant source. He's gotten involved in the slave trade, something that Morpheus discourages because of its immorality. It seems it's taken this long for Hob to finally ask him what his name is and what his deal is, but before he can answer, the two are attacked by Joanna Constantine, the ancestor of our own Johnny Boy. It seems somehow a few people caught on that these two weirdos kept meeting every hundred years, and she's been planning on interrupting this meeting to learn how and why they did this. But Morpheus just uses his dream dust to deal with them and show them ghosts from their own past. At 1889, they meet once more, Morpheus even commenting that he ended up seeing Joanna Constantine again and recruiting her for a task. Hobbs states that he's met a few other immortals since their last meeting, including Jason Blood of Etrican the Demon fame. He also deeply regrets being involved in the slave trade now, and he's had his ups and downs in life, but he's come to realize that Morpheus isn't still doing this because he's curious about what happens when a man doesn't die. Since there are several of those running around. He thinks Morpheus wants friendship and companionship, an idea that Morpheus finds insulting, leaving in a huff. 
Hob declares that if they meet again in a hundred years, it'll be because they're friends. And thus we arrive in the present day, where Morpheus arrives and declares that it's impolite of him to keep his friends waiting. What I find really great about the story of Hob Gadling is that it's such an inversion on the usual trope. In fantasy and sci-fi, you have the immortal who regrets living for so long, is really sad about it. Oh, I've seen too much. But Hob is the inversion of that. He always thinks there's more to see. I'd like to think that that's the attitude I'd take. When you think of how much has changed for the world culturally, technologically, socially, artistically, in only 50 years alone, much less 600 years, there really is so much to see and learn and figure out. It's also important as a character piece for Morpheus, because indeed, he is lonely. The other realms of the Endless tend to be pretty sparsely populated, if at all, but Morpheus surrounds himself with creations and other beings, people with their own tales and stories, who can aid him and provide some form of companionship. And Hob Gadling, for all his faults, is a pretty unique person who has changed over the centuries in what he values and cares about. And this won't be the last time we see him. But let's get back to the regular stories with issue 17, beginning Dream Country. Dream Country is less of a storyline and instead a series of single issue short stories with two not very significant and two with more significance, beginning with Calliope. It seems that in 1927, the muse Calliope of Greek mythology was captured by a writer named Aramis Fry. Fry kept her prisoner and raped her, granting him creative inspiration and a long writing career. In 1986, now an old man, he sells her to a struggling writer, Richard Maddock, who can't even start his second book and the publisher is breathing down his neck. Doing the same awful things as Fry, even trying to sickeningly justify it to himself that she's not even human, he soon finds the same amount of success. Writing deals, poetry, critical acclaim and fortune, etc. Calliope contacts the three witches as the Furies, begging for help, but unfortunately there's nothing they can do. They do suggest that Morpheus could free her, but she's reluctant. It seems the two used to date. In fact, the two had a child together, whom we'll be learning more about in another video. Still, since it's 1986, Morpheus can't help her anyway, since he's still imprisoned by Burgess. And over the next few years, Maddox continues his horrible ways while gaining more success. I loved your characterization of Aileen. There aren't enough strong enough women in fiction. Actually, I do tend to regard myself as a feminist writer. Ah, I see we accidentally started reading a Joss Whedon biography. Thankfully, in 1989, Morpheus is finally freed and is informed of what happened to Calliope. And as we've seen, he may have some problems understanding parts of humanity, but he understands exactly how evil and terrible this is, and not only frees her, but punishes Richard Maddock. He needs inspiration and creativity? Fine. He can drown in it. Maddock finds himself unable to do anything else. He has too many ideas in his head, and he's going mad trying to write them all down, even using the blood from his fingers to do the deed. In the meantime, Calliope points out that Morpheus has changed by his recent experiences, since in the past he would have left her to rot because of his own dickish pride and unforgiving nature. He admits he no longer hates her over what has happened, and even sets Maddock free from the punishment upon her request, which is very nice of her, but I say let him stew for a while, given the sheer level of his crimes. In any case, they part on decent terms, and that brings us to issue 18, A Dream of a Thousand Cats. It's not a favorite of mine. I get thematically what it's going for concerning how dreams can shape reality and whatnot, but even putting aside that plot-wise it has nothing to do with anything else, it has some bad things happening to cats in it, and I love my cats, and I don't like seeing stories where bad things happen to cats. Starfire is actually sleeping right next to me right now. It's artistically beautiful, basically a dark fairy tale about a cat who seeks justice for her kittens being murdered by her owners over petty, stupid reasons, who ends up meeting with Morpheus. Morpheus explains to her how, once upon a time, humans were the servants of giant cats, who used them for their own amusement until one day a human realized that dreams shaped the world and recreated anew. Thus, if they collectively dream of a world where they are in charge, it will be so. Morpheus seems to suggest that this cat's task is to do the same thing, to get as many cats as possible to dream of the world as it was and to reshape it once again. Is that why he's such an asshole at times? That the dreams he watched over used to be from cats, but then humans rose up and he doesn't understand them as well as he does cats? Like I said, not a favorite of mine, but I get why others like it. Issue 19 is A Midsummer Night's Dream. And unfortunately, these last two I also don't really care for either. In this one's case, it's not because of the content being bad or anything. Hell, this issue won a World Fantasy Award. The problem is, 
I've never actually seen or read Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, which is the entire point of the story. I'm not a huge Shakespeare reader, and most of the stuff I have studied is the tragedies. Macbeth, Julius Caesar, Hamlet, etc. I've seen none of the historicals, and only one of the comedies, Comedy of Errors. I think I saw As You Like It once, but it was so long ago I don't remember anything about it. I suppose you could say I've seen Taming of the Shrew, but only because I've seen 10 Things I Hate About You, which is probably not how the bard intended it to be seen. The point is that because I'm not familiar with the work, a lot of the symbolism and meaning and connection are lost on me. The important plot point here ties us back to Morpheus's deal with Shakespeare. In return for his writing career, Morpheus has two plays that he could specifically request. The first is A Midsummer Night's Dream. He has Shakespeare acting troupe performed the play specifically to fairy folk, some of whom are in the play itself, like Titania and Oberon. Morpheus explains to the queen that because her kind have decided to leave the mortal plane forever, and they provided so much amusement and story and mirth that he wanted to honor them, make sure that a memory, even one that's not historically true, would live on forever among mortals. It's definitely a sweet gesture, and we'll be seeing the fairies again in the future. Rereading it for the retrospective, I appreciate it more than I originally did, but a lot of it is still lost on me, I'm afraid. Let's get to the final comic we'll talk about today. Issue 20, Facade. It's a tragedy, and a bit of a depressing beat to end on. I honestly have no idea why it's here. It doesn't feature Morpheus, it's not an extension of any plot lines. It does feature death, I suppose, and it gives us a bit of insight into her. But I'm not very fond of it, and it feels a bit out of place with the rest of the series. Element Girl, aka Urana Blackwell, was a supporting character for Metamorpho back when he had his own comic. She got the same kind of powers as him from the Orb of Ra, the Egyptian sun god. So of course this tragedy is the fault of our long-standing foe, Ancient Egypt! <laughs> Anne eventually found herself pretty much ostracized from society and her former spy employers because of her appearance. She can't really live a normal life, she doesn't really want to be a superhero, and she lives on a veteran's check she gets once a month, so no one to talk to, no friends or loved ones. It sucks and she hates it, and especially after she has a run-in with an old friend and her fake skin mask falls off to her embarrassment, she just wants to die. And who should show up dealing with a woman who accidentally died in the same apartment building but Death herself? The two have a conversation about it, and Death tries to cheer her up and encourage her, but nothing going. Unfortunately, due to her nature, there's nothing she can really do to kill herself. She'd either survive the attempt or remain conscious despite anything terrible happening to her. And Death doesn't kill people as she explains. She's just the guide to pass them on. She was there waiting when the first living being appeared, and she'll be there to turn out the lights when all living things expire, but she can't just kill her. Still, she tells her to finally speak to Ra by staring directly into the sun, who grants her request and turns her into salt or something. I guess what bothers me about this story is that as someone who fervently believes that life is always preferable to death, that existence can be filled with joy and friendship and warmth even under the most difficult of circumstances, that it seems to take the stance that suicide is a perfectly acceptable solution, and I can't accept that. You can probably argue that this is very much in the vein of assisted suicide for someone suffering, and Element Girl is indeed suffering, but I don't know. She has a disability, yes, a condition that makes her life harder to bear, but especially speaking to this now, when disability rights are also a very important thing that people are fighting for, equal treatment and things like marriages and taxes and accessibility, I have to read this comic that takes the stance of, yeah, killing yourself is probably the best outcome. I don't know, maybe I'm just reading way too much into it and I'm talking out of my ass with that interpretation. It's just not a story I like to revisit compared to some of these other ones. But Sandman is, overall, a great series to revisit. The first 20 issues showed a lot of what made the series great. Fantasy, horror, interesting characters, and a lot of plot threads that would be revisited down the road. So come back next time as we check out the next 20 issues, we'll meet with Barbie again, learn some more of Morpheus's long history, and ask an interesting question. What happens when the devil decides to quit?
am a dire wolf, prey stalking, lethal prowler. I am a hunter, horse mounted, wolf stabbing, naked for some reason, riding on horseback. I think I just defeated myself. Hello my friends, please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell for notifications on new video releases. If you'd like to support future videos, you can check out my Patreon or purchase a t-shirt via Teespring or Shark Robot. Thanks for watching!